This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's episode is about the Yakima War. The Yakima lived along the Columbia, Yakima, and Wenatchee Rivers in what is now Washington State. The Yakima were hunters, gatherers, and salmon fishers before colonization. They encountered the Lewis and Clark Expedition in 1805 at the confluence of the Yakima and Columbia Rivers. The expedition was soon followed by greater and greater numbers of American and British trappers and traders, and then settlers, who put demands on the land and resources. In late May and early June 1855, the then governor of the Washington Territory, Isaac Stevens, and Oregon Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Joel Palmer, met with a number of tribal nations, including the Cayuse, Nez Perce, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Yakima, during the Walla Walla Council, to negotiate treaties and to open native lands to white settlement. The tribal nations did not request the council, and many of them did not want to negotiate with the U.S. government those who attended did so to protect their people and their tribal interests. Stevens and Palmer warned that if the tribal nations did not agree to reservation boundaries, that the white settlers would, quote, steal your horses and cattle, unquote. The Yakima reluctantly agreed to a treaty, ceding 11 million acres of land to the U.S. government. In exchange, the Yakima would move onto a new reservation and receive federal benefits. They reserved the right to hunt and fish on the ceded land. The Yakima were supposed to be given time to relocate to the reservation, and Governor Stevens assured them that miners and settlers would not trespass on their lands until the treaty was ratified by the U.S. Senate. However, after gold strikes in the region, Miners started to trespass on tribal lands. As they crossed them en route to the gold fields, the miners didn't just trespass. They stole horses from the Yakima and assaulted the women. In response, Yakima warriors killed miners in isolated incidents. As tensions rose, an agent of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Andrew J. Bolin, rode out to investigate on September 20, 1855. Bullen was killed by a few of the Yakima he had been traveling with, led by Mishil, son of Yakima chief Shumawe. Many years later, an eyewitness claimed that Mishil had said, quote, I want to kill him the same as he killed my poor people, unquote. Bullen's death panicked the settlers in the area, and Major Granville O. Haller, was ordered to take a company of American soldiers from Fort Dallas to the Yakima Valley. On October 5, 1855, the soldiers were attacked by a band of Yakima under Chief Kamiakan along the Tapanash Creek. Five American soldiers were killed and 17 wounded, and Haller and his company were forced to retreat. In response, Major Gabriel J. Rains and 700 troops marched on Chief Kamiakin and his 300 warriors on November 8, 1855, at Union Gap on the bank of the Yakima River. The Yakima families fled as the warriors fought. By morning, the Yakima were nearly surrounded, and they beat a quick retreat. The war lasted for several years, with the last phase in 1858. In September 1858, Colonel George Wright defeated the Native Americans 
at the Battle of Four Lakes near Spokane, Washington. On September 23rd, he imposed a peace treaty in a council of the local Native Americans at Latah Creek. Under the terms of the peace treaty, the tribal nations were forced onto the reservations. On May 8, 1859, the U.S. Senate finally ratified the 1855 treaty, and it was proclaimed into law on April 18, 1859. Some of the tribal nations, such as the Palouse, refused to acknowledge the treaty and would not enter the reservation. The Yakima Reservation, along the Yakima River, covers an area of around 1.2 million acres. The Yakima people are enrolled in the federally recognized Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation, and the Yakima Tribal Council includes representatives of 14 tribes. The Yakima Nation has more than 6,000 members and a flag that shows the borders of the reservation in white against a sky-blue background. The sacred mountain, Mount Adams, is depicted within the map, as is a sacred eagle, the morning star symbol of guidance and leadership, and arcing around Mount Adams are 14 gold stars and 14 eagle feathers, honoring the bands of the Yakima Nation. In the mid-1990s, the Yakima Nation renamed itself, changing the spelling from Y-A-K-I-M-A to Y-A-K-A-M-A to more closely reflect the pronunciation in their native language. To help us understand more, I'm joined now by Emily Washines, who is an enrolled Yakima Nation tribal member with Cree and Skokomish lineage. Emily is a scholar whose research topics include the Yakima War, Native Women, Traditional Knowledge, Resource Management, Fishing Rights, and Food Sovereignty. She runs the Native Friends blog and hosts the War Cry podcast. So hi, Emily. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, so I have uh, a bunch of questions for you about the Yakima War, but I wanted to start by asking a little bit about your background. Uh, I believe you live on the Yakima Reservation now. Is that where you grew up as well? Yes, I grew up here. I lived um, a couple other places, and then I came back here after college and where I'm raising my family. Did you, have you always been interested in the, the history and the culture of the, the Yakima? You know, how, how did you get more into sort of studying this, uh, this particular war, the Yakima War? Primarily, a lot of the information I learned was through our oral history and, you know, just different family members talking about it, especially around specific uh, commemorative events, such as uh, our treaty signing. We commemorate that each year. And having these anecdotal conversations, uh, that's where I would say it's it started, is just hearing from um, our family members. You started with the, these oral histories. What is the way that you're sort of following up to learn more? I, you know, I, I think this is a history that's been hidden, suppressed, what, whatever it is, um, but isn't very well known. And so what are you doing to try to learn more about it uh, and help other people learn more about it? Yeah, so my uh, great-great-grandfather was a treaty signer uh, of the uh, Yakima Treaty with the United States. And so I feel like there's a responsibility for me to always know the history, including the history of my own ancestors' actions and maybe some of the decisions. And as I was grew up, I would start to read a little bit more about that. But I did find there was a really big disconnect in between what was written in the historical record by non-natives compared to what I had grown up hearing for decades. And the turning point for me into having a validation of that was the uh, oral uh, history uh, that ended up getting written by Alex Saluskin. And so that was a account of a battle of the Yakima War in 1855. You mentioned that there were some uh, discrepancies between what you had heard and then, you know, what what you read in the historical record. So, what are some of those things that uh, that the the different uh, accounts are are sort of getting different in the story? I primarily uh, that how the why the Yakima War started. 
So I guess 90% of historians out there would disagree with what Yakimas say and what I say about why the Yakima War uh, started. Uh, a lot of um, erasure of our Native women in the historical record or lightning of violence against Native women. Uh, so I think that being a Native woman, being a Yakima, seeing an erasure in a historical record that hit very personally to me, mm -hmm. Um, especially as somebody that can see patterns in history and how things might repeat. We um, hear about and a lot about uh, Native erasure today. So what is, uh, what is your reason for why the Yakima War started that you think that historians might disagree with? Yeah, uh, I want to give a little bit of context. In 1855, uh, June of 1855, Yakimas had, had signed the treaty with the United States. Uh, by the fall time, there was gold that was found in Upper Washington. The treaty was not yet ratified by Congress, which is a necessary bureaucratic step uh, that we still saw delays in 1800s. Some miners that were passing through from Snoqualmie Pass to through Yakima and up to Colville had uh, committed violence against Native women and girls. So they uh, raped and murdered uh, um, the wife and the daughters of Moose Hill, including a child in a cradle board. And Moose Hill, the husband, went with two uh, or three friends and killed the miners. They didn't want them to continue these acts of violence. Historically, the United uh, they had checkpoints for miners, so they would be able to tell when they would come to one, leave one place and show up at the other. When the miners didn't show up, that alerted a lot of the uh, agents at that time to kind of check out and see what was going on. And when Yakima's had reported this act of violence, it was a big shrug. And they said, unless you turn over this widowed man that just lost his wife and children to this horrible act of violence, unless you turn him over now to the viral government, we will start a war. And I'm going to go back to the Dalles in Oregon and I'm going to go back down to the Dalles and tell them to come up here and come after you. And so we considered that a threat. So we killed that agent to get more time to assemble more people, basically people from other tribes. And, and, and then, you know, Major Howler had come up from the Dalles shortly after that. Um, the point in history that there's a disconnect is a lot of the historians begin and say the start of the war is with the killing of the miners. Mm. Or they'll say there was some disgruntling or disgruntled Native women. It makes us sound like we got our moccasins stepped on or something, or like they didn't tip their hat at us. It doesn't sound like there's the taking of life, which is a really big issue. Yeah. So to to sort of put this in context, this is later than a lot of the uh, conflicts we see and the, the treaty signing and the uh, land grabs and things uh, further east because, the you know, sort of the U.S. is finally getting this far west. And Washington is not yet a state yet at this point, right? It's a, a territory. Yes. Let's talk about the treaty. You mentioned that, uh, that your relative was a, a signer of the treaty. So what was uh, the, the point of this treaty that, that then took so long to be ratified? What, what would the agreement have been? Yes, so we signed the treaty in 1855, and it was ratified by Congress in 1859. And in between that point, we had a three-year war. At that point, we had had contact. We had even uh, tribal members from other uh, bands, Klickitat band, uh, numerous bands confederated under the Yakima Nation, 14 uh, different tribes and bands. And they worked for the Hudson Bay Company. We had some inner, not in my family specific, but in other families, tribal families, we saw intermarriage with some of the Hudson Bay uh, company folks, which when we talk about the landscape of the time, it was really interesting to see how the, these white people that were from the Hudson Bay company were making sure that we had our story heard, that there was different, um, even priests that were translating and transcribing and sending letters. And so I think even when looking at the history of war, it's very complicated, right? There's not like the simple, straightforward us versus them. And what 
what I think hasn't happened is this dialogue and these little stories that bring the humanity into it. I think at that point, we had known that other tribes had had contact with other, uh, with non-natives. Um, we had seen, you know, what was happening in California um, when there was gold found up there. And I think that we, from when, when I was a very young girl, one of my earliest memories was sitting at our ceremonial table with so many cousins and aunts, tables full. And they would say, I need you to listen. I need you to hear me and what I'm saying. And they said, the reason that we signed the treaty is to protect the resources for those not yet born. And of course, I always reflect back on this because even as a child, because I would watch like the Brady Bunch and different shows like that. And I wouldn't see them talking about these historical notes. I wouldn't see them telling this four-year-old, you're responsible for carrying this message. Your relative uh, signed this, your great grandfather. And now you need to make sure to uphold that word and um, the reasoning for this and to communicate that. So is this something then uh, that you tell your kids as well? Yes, my children will often uh, sit at my laptop station and uh, mimic and mime out everything that I say, which is, you don't know that they're catching on as much, but I'm, I'm proud about how much they know and learn about our treaty rights. Yeah, and you also uh, know the language. So it's the Yakima language, but I think there's another uh, term for it <laughs> as well. Yeah, we refer to it as itchy skin. And linguists refer to it as Sahaptan, but the direct translation of that means stranger in their land. Uh, so linguistically, that's the their official term. But in Yakima culture, we kind of like side eye that <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. We don't want to call our language a stranger in our land. Yeah. And so is this, uh, has this language continued, you know, is it the sort of more or less the same language as it, it was during the Yakima War, for instance? Yeah, we have different dialects of that language because there's so many different tribes and bands, but we continue to utilize that same uh, words, the words and songs specifically, which have, uh, we don't record our songs. And so that's all passed down through the oral uh, tradition. We don't record our ceremonial washa songs, uh, different songs like powwow or um, social gathering songs we'll record. And you, uh, you made a video about the Yakima War uh, in which part of it is in the, the native language. Can you talk some about the inspiration behind making that video and you know, sort of how you decided to put it together? Yeah, I actually um, was the victim of a crime. And I, for insurance purposes, I had to go through and get all these paperwork. And I came across this historical account of the Yakima War in my like distressed shuffling of papers. And I just really connected strongly to it. I've read this historical account every year since I was 16 at school when I was given it. And this time after I had been this victim of a crime and had somebody that was targeting me, it just hit different. And I really started to fold into this whole process and it really fold into it parallel of what I was experiencing because in some way it gave me strength. It spoke about resiliency. And then just different parts of it really stuck out. For example, the fact that Yak women fought in the war and the fact that the war started because uh, Native women had violence against them. And I just, I really wanted to visually tell this story. And so I did apply for a grant with the Evergreen State College. There, uh, they had uh, grants for different artists. And I thought, I will put this whole thing away if I don't get this grant, or I'll just move forward with it. I just, it was kind of an all in or nothing. I just, I don't really gamble that much, but that whole <laughs> scene where you <laughs> see the people put in the chips, it was like all my history books, all my notes were slid forward in that moment. And I wanted to see if this was something that we should talk about in the Northwest. And it was so fragile with it at that point that if I didn't get that validation right away, I was going to like slide away and just privately process it and privately talk about it with my family like we've done for decades. Mm. And can you talk about the beautiful beadwork that's in the video? Yeah, I originally wanted actors and I had different um, gruffy archaeologists willing to be in my film. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I thought that might be really historically uh, triggering for a lot of our tribal members to see that. And that there's still a lot of tribal people that are emotional about it. And I really wanted to use this visual medium of beadwork to help depict that story. Um, my mother uh, beaded, did a lot of the beadwork uh, that I used in the film, Stella Washines. And uh, I don't know why she beaded some of these pieces, but when I was able to go through her different suitcase with it, it was a really great moment to just revisit again that history that's passed down um, between family members. Yeah, and I, uh, I I love that kind of history. That's not you know something you'd find written in an archive, but instead comes from material objects. I, I think that's so powerful, and it's really uh, it's powerful in the film. I think it probably I understand the the point about not being triggering, but I also think it's uh, it's really special to to see it that way in the video. So I will put a link uh, to that, of course, in the show notes, uh, so people can find it. Uh, I wanted to ask too. You've been uh, you've done some work to connect to the descendants of the U.S. troops who fought in the Yakima War. Can you talk some about how, how that came about and, and why you're, you're working on that? Whenever you review history and you're a Native, you'll, uh, and then they're written by non-Natives, you'll frequently see words like bloodthirsty and hostile. And I kept seeing that, and I'm a pretty optimistic person. I try to keep an open mind about people and events. Uh, but it just put me in a bad mood. <laughs> like it put me in a very defensive mood. Like I'm not hostile. I'm not bloodthirsty. These are my relatives they're talking about. And this, so to be kind of framed in that way, I took issue with it. But then I also wondered what I just got curious. Basically, I was curious about this, what the other side might think. Did they think I was bloodthirsty and hostile? what stories might be uh, might have been passed down from the other side and the mo more I thought about it I just wanted to meet one of them I mean I would ask people in jury duty I would ask people in the cereal aisle hey, have you ever heard about the Yakima War hey did you do you do you know any descendants that might have fought in the Yakima War against my relatives and I'll tell you, there's a very big difference between being in your research mode, asking these questions and in like a cereal aisle as a brown person asking for people <laughs> to fight against your relatives. <laughs> and I, ha I had some really frank discussions. People had a lot of doubts if I would ever find the descendants on the other side. And I always remember them saying like, Emily, even if you find them, what makes them think they're going to want to talk to you? But they did. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, went to Fort Walla Walla Museum and asked them, and a little while later, I got a call from the descendant, uh, Steve Plucker, uh, whose uh, great-great-grandfather was in the Army, fought against my relatives in the Yakima War. And I remember it very clearly. I was heading to a, a gymnastics class with my kids, and it just, our conversation seemed to really flow. I ended up uh, beta test reading his book that was coming out about the Yakima War. And it eventually progressed to this point where I asked him to stand by my side as I told our version and our side of the history. And so when I first met him, it was actually, I was presenting my film at Fort Walla Walla Museum and he stood by my side. And I love these aspects of like human connection and just us being able to talk to each other that just seems to shatter these stereotypical us versus them dynamics like he may not agree with every single historical point that I share or that our people did we weren't obviously aligned in 1855 about what we were doing and where we were at but yet he's able to stand by my side as I tell this history and not get like really cut me off or try to be disrespectful about that at all he's just allowing me the space and proving that he's there to support me bringing this story and historical um, record forward. It's beautiful. I like that. I, I think it would be good if, uh, if we could have more experiences like that. <laughs> People who, who have historically been on, on other sides of, of conflicts. 
Uh, so I, I wanted to ask too, uh, obviously all of the sort of history you work on is is public history, um, but you uh, specifically have this Native Friends uh, website where you share culture and, and language uh, and this history. Can you talk some about uh, your website and your desire to to share your culture? Yeah, I think when some of my relatives have been photographed by Edward Curtis, and when you go on Pinterest, you will see frequently a lot of Edward Curtis images. And you, when you look for things like, hey, what's this Native American uh, Yakima think about, I don't know, a, a current event that's happening, or what's a fashion that they're wearing today? There seems to be a really big gap in those photographs of that information, of that insight. And it just seems like something that my site native friends can help bring a little bit more information to where I talk about how we returned a plant after a 70 year absence without seeds or without planting. Um, we just did that from listening to our elders and the biologist fixing the land. Uh, I talk about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and uh, also fishing rights. And I really like being able to have something in my hands and being able to write and visually display and give information for audiences. As an educator, I understand that importance of having visuals like video or photos. And I also understand the benefit of having like a voice or a direct quote from people, uh, not just having to go buy that book that references somebody from 1855, like reference a living tribal member. <laughs> That's here today. Yeah, that that seems to have been a, a theme of uh, <laughs> the episodes I've done this month is, uh, you know, we're still here, <laughs> which uh, is, is so important. Uh, I was remarking with my husband this morning, you know, we both grew up in, you know, in the Midwest in the 80s. And I think that the message that we were told was that, you know, sort of Native Americans were part of the past uh, and, and not here and present and with us. Uh, and I'm so glad that finally uh, I, I'm able to at least teach my children. <laughs> no, they're still here. They're important. Let's listen to them. So I, I love the website. I think it's great that uh, that you're doing it. And I love the videos on um, like counting in uh, in your language. I, I think that's really it's it's fun and it, it helps brings it bring it alive. Thank you. My kids uh, love to be on film and do different <laughs> things. I find little tiny films on my iPad all the time. That they're doing. <laughs> Here's some slime. Love it. So then the other thing I wanted to ask about, uh, you also host a, a podcast called War Cry Podcast, where you talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, that podcast and that project. Yeah, I published a peer-reviewed case study with Evergreen Native Cases last year called War Cry. And when I was talking to other community members about missing and murdered Indigenous women, the crisis broadly, the crisis in the Northwest, as well as here in Yakima, there just seem to be different conversational elements from the points that I made in my case study that we really wanted to have and share. Almost be as if we were in a diner and people were like at the next table, like what would they hear us talk about? Uh, so we wanted to have it very conversational. And we also wanted to have these points about historical connections and how much historical connections really are important points to make in addressing this crisis. Uh, so we launched uh, on Treaty Days uh, in June, 2020, June 9th, 2020, and we're in our second season now. And we talk and discuss about uh, either dif different interviews with family members or specific events that we feel are connected to this larger um, movement, including violent acts, um, assimilation, such as boarding school, uh, unmarked graves, and the lists that are published here in Washington State for our missing people. We, we Up until a year ago, we didn't have the names of our missing people that were Native that was withheld from us, which seems so confusing about why you would have family members and loved ones that went and filed a missing persons report and gave this information in hopes of somebody being found 
but they're locked away in these like law enforcement systems. You can only be in law enforcement to access certain these federal systems. And, you know, it, within the past year, we have now had access to that, those names and information. And so on the podcast, we'll do things like share that the list has been updated, highlight uh, cases that are local. What does that crisis look like right now? You know, I, I, I'm really focusing on different aspects of, of that uh, crisis. Uh, I think anytime a Native woman goes missing, you want to assume that everybody's on board with finding her, that she's going to have the same process and resources that others do. But what is coming out clearly is that she doesn't, that there's often victim blaming, that there's often uh, delays in process, delays in reporting, uh, basically people saying like she's not a priority, you know, uh, and telling family members that. And so it's a really hard uh, thing to see and to uh, work with family members. It's it's very triggering to be in in that type of situation where you're seeing a Native woman is not valued. And I always try to take different examples and say, let's say you're watching the American Pie movie uh, and there is kind of a party uh, sense about that whole thing. But let's say all of them went missing. And what resources or things would come about if they went missing? And what would be said about them? Oh, they were just having a good time. They, you know, made, they were just being kids. Obviously, they made a mistake. But when it's a Native woman that does those types of things, it's what was she doing? What was she wearing? Who was she around? It, it's, it's horrible to kind of think about it in that way and in that light, but that's the comparison that I give to people just to try to frame it so that they understand, like, we do not have the same access to resources. We do not have the same response when we go missing. And it's even when we take steps to protect ourselves, we're often prosecuted by the federal government, meaning um, self-defense. Uh, we had a case of Madison George in, it was in the federal court in Spokane. She's a Colville tribal member in Northern Washington state. And she uh, said she was raped and the person that had raped her stalked her and found her and she shot him. And the federal government prosecuted her uh, recently and uh, she did a plea deal and they sentenced her. And when the federal government was recommending sentencing, they went above and beyond their own sentencing guidelines. They like tripled it. And the judge had to tell them, listen, we have these different federal acts that were passed by Congress mandating your guidance for how to address violence against Native women that you're not even following. That's the Power Act, the Not Invisible Act, and Savannah's Act. So you can even have these congressional uh, momentums happen, these people that have rallied around these bills, think that it would mean movement. And at the same time, have the federal government prosecute a Native woman for protecting herself. If she had not protected herself, a lot of legal scholars say she would have been another statistic. Mm -hmm. So the crisis, there's a lot of different points that, you know, need help. Those are just a couple examples. So in addition to listening to the Work I podcast, which everyone should do, what are other ways that that people can uh, can help, can raise awareness uh, or get action on this? The MMIW USA uh, web social media has a lot of the updated information um, on their website about missing people cases and alerts. Uh, we don't have necessarily a, a, a federal alert system that works in that same manner. Uh, so if you want to know about cases that are there uh, or share it, uh, that's a good place to go. There's, I would say, you know, look at your local areas for what the tribal members and tribes are asking nearby. I think that's an important um, place to kind of center it is what are they asking for? What did, what are their needs? Uh, I know for Yakima, we also have a local list that's maintained by the Yakima Herald Republic called The Vanished. And they're one of three newspapers in the nation that I'm aware of that publicly list missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, so supporting local journalism as well is really big aspect to that. Why 
does this tiny non-tribal local newspaper publicly list that? Why don't others? I mean, but their editors will know that it, they need to do it if people keep going to it and clicking on it. <laughs> right. So is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about today? I think when you're trying to find more information about Native Americans, it's really good to read literature or books, either nonfiction or fiction about it, and, and hear directly from Natives. I think that could be a really good source uh, of information. Uh, and of course, for visual learners, you can always check out my website or other uh, film or videos that are out there to help you know give insight about who we are. And I, as I said, we'll put links uh, to those things uh, in the show notes. So I hope people will check them out. Uh, and then lastly, we're uh, encouraging people uh, throughout the month of November, and of course, continuing after the month of November to make donations to Native causes. Uh, are there any particular uh, organizations that you would recommend that people donate to? I would say the MMIWUSA. Okay, terrific. Well, Emily, thank you so much uh, for speaking with me, for sharing your knowledge uh, with me, but also for just sharing your knowledge uh, uh, on Native Friends and in your podcast and, and other places. Uh, so thank you. This was really great. It's great to be here. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. MSW.